Hey y'all, today we're gonna take a look at an application of Coulomb's law and we're gonna look at photoelectron spectroscopy or PES. Photoelectron spectroscopy utilizes Coulomb's law heavily. So keep in mind what we learned in the last video. Coulombic attraction or electrostatic attraction is between electrons in the nucleus because they have opposite charges and is based off of the fact that we have a nuclear charge in the nucleus and number of energy levels or shells around that nucleus where the electrons reside. Coulomb's law, if you remember, is gonna have a relationship where the force of attraction between the nucleus and that valence electron is going to be equal to ish, right? Again, we're not looking for a specific number, it's just relative, but equal ish to the charge, which we call the effective nuclear charge, divided by the distance, which we looked at the number of energy levels or the number of shells to determine that. So let's look at how this applies to photoelectron spectroscopy. And we'll give you some examples of what type of data you're going to look at and be able to analyze by the end of this video. The photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is when you shoot energy at an atom. If that wavelength of energy, if that little photon hits an electron, and if that photon is of sufficient energy, what it can do is rip that electron away. It'll shoot that electron out of the atom, give it enough energy to break free of its attraction to the nucleus. When that electron shoots off, what we can do is actually measure the energy with which the electron hits a sensor. So think of it this way. If I shoot energy at an electron, it hits that electron, the electron shoots away. The difference between the energy that I shot it with and the energy with which that electron left with is going to be the energy with which that electron was bound to the nucleus. We call this the binding energy. So the greater the binding energy, the stronger the attraction by the electron to that nucleus. So with photoelectron spectroscopy, what we're gonna do is we're gonna shoot energy at these atoms we're going to measure the energy of the electrons being bounced away from these atoms. And that's going to give us a readout of binding energy. And that's what the graphs that we're going to be looking at here, such as this one down at the bottom, show us. Each of these relative little peaks that you see represents the binding energy of a specific sublevel of electrons. So when we're analyzing this graph, the x-axis represents the energy with which those electrons were bound to the nucleus. So in this PES readout, as I said, each of those peaks represents electrons from a different sublevel or subshell. When we look at these, there's two variables associated with each peak. One is where it falls in the x-axis. Be careful here, sometimes, weirdly, these x-axis work in the opposite direction you would think, like this one. The bigger numbers are actually on the left side, whereas the smaller numbers are on the right. Now that's opposite of what we would normally see, but the reason is because as we're reading this from left to right, what that's representing are electrons from increasingly attracted sublevels or subshells. So that first peak of the highest energy, those are the electrons that take the most energy to remove. Those electrons come from the 1s sublevel. They're the closest to the nucleus. Therefore, they show the greatest force of attraction you can now look at the height of that. Now we know the 1s sublevel has two electrons. So that height that you see there represents two electrons. It's a magnitude. In the next peak we see, it's the same height. That also means it represents two electrons. That's because this is the 2s sublevel. Immediately after that, we see a peak that's much higher, three times higher. Three times two is six. That means this peak represents six electrons. And it's a little bit higher energy. This is because it's from the 2p sublevel. The 2p sublevel is a little bit higher energy than the 2s sublevel. We go to the next level. Now notice this. This one, the height of the peak is only half that of the 1s and the 2s sublevels, which means this only has one electron one electron in the 3s sublevel. So if I were to look at the electron configuration of this based on the PES diagram here, 
I'd say it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, which means that I'm looking right here at sodium. This atom, where I'm seeing the PES data here, is the sodium atom. And I can figure that out using both the number and the height of the different peaks. So how would this differ if we changed the atom? Here I've got sodium, which we just looked at, but now I'm gonna compare it to magnesium, which is the next element on the periodic table. The difference between sodium and magnesium comes down to two things. One, the number of protons. Magnesium has one extra proton. Secondly, the number of electrons. Magnesium as an atom also has one more electron. So if we look at the PES diagram, I can see that extra electron in that 3s sublevel peak, where in the sodium, it's the height of one. In the magnesium, it would be the height of two, right? Double that height means twice as many electrons. In this case, it would be two electrons. But the other thing I want you to look at here is where on the x-axis each of these peaks falls. If you look at the sodium, all of its peaks are shifted a little bit to the right compared to the magnesium. That means each of those electrons is a little bit easier to remove from a sodium atom than it is from a magnesium atom. Why would that be? Well, in the end, it comes down to that nuclear charge. Sodium is one fewer proton. So each electron you remove is a little bit easier to pull away than it is from magnesium. So what we see here as a result is not only a change in the y-axis, but also some changes in the x-axis. We can use both to be able to predict what atoms we're looking at. And in the end, we use this to make determinations based off of relative forces of attraction. If it takes more energy to rip an electron away, it's because there's a greater force of attraction on that electron. If it takes less energy to rip an electron away, it's because it takes, it's because that energy is less. All right, and so the force of attraction is less for that electron compared to the alternative where it might be more. So now that we've learned how to do this, I want you to take a second and identify the atom shown by this PES diagram. Once you do, go ahead and come back and we'll talk about it. So did you get sulfur? If you didn't, let's talk about why. And if you did, great. Let's still talk about why. When we look at the PES diagram, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assign each of those peaks what sublevel it came from. So that first peak on the left is 1s2, then 2s2 is next to it. The high peak there right next to that one is 2p6. The short one on the to the right of it is 3s2. And then we see a peak that is twice as high as the 3s2, which suggests that there are four electrons. This would be in the 3p sublevel, so it would be 3p4. 3p4, if we do our electron configuration and look across, represents sulfur. So this atom that I have the PES diagram here for is sulfur. Let's do another practice problem. Now this one's a little bit different because I'm asking about some properties of the atoms involved. Here I've got the same sublevel electron shown, but for two different elements, beryllium and magnesium. And I need you to explain for me which one is which and why they are different. All right, so go ahead and do that. And we'll come back and we'll talk about it. So the X here is representing the 2S electrons in beryllium. Now, it's really important to note that even though beryllium and magnesium are in different periods, which means they have different numbers of energy levels or energy shells or electron shells, it's important to note that we're comparing apples to apples here. We're looking at the same electrons in both. Now in beryllium, those happen to be the valence electrons, but in magnesium, they are not. In magnesium, they're actually the core electrons. So because we're comparing the exact same electrons together, it's not about the distance. It's not about the, the distance away or the number of shells away from the nucleus. In this case, it's all about the protons. Magnesium has more protons. Therefore, the attractive force of those 2s electrons is going to be greater in magnesium than it is in the beryllium because of the protons. 
And again, it's because of the fact that we are dealing with the same two electrons, the 2s electrons, in both of these atoms. That's an important thing to remember. That wraps up today's video. It was a pretty quick one. And in today's video, we learned how to apply Coulomb's law to photoelectron spectroscopy. We learned how to use the graph produced from photoelectron spectroscopy to identify atoms. And then we used our knowledge of atomic structure to be able to discern between two different PES diagrams. Keep in mind, the photoelectric effect here is the underlying principle. It takes energy to pull electrons away. And when we shoot light at atoms, we are going to be able to eject electrons if we can overcome that binding energy. PES utilizes that to be able to determine what the energy of those electrons was in the first place. It's really important that you're able to apply this same principle in a lot of different scenarios. We looked at a couple today, but there might be a few others that you come up against. Just keep in mind that it's always the same premise. You're always looking at the same thing. Today's video was written, directed, produced, and edited by Connor Sang. I'd like to thank you guys for watching it. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.